And I think it contrasts it with those scornful or contemptful folks because they can be irritating, right? <laughs> As I say this or read this psalm to you, I bet you're thinking of somebody that's doing it to you now. <laughs> and God's saying, listen, that's might be true, but fix your eyes on me as you bring yourself up out of the forest, or excuse me, the trees, and you so you could see the forest, the eternal perspective. I heard uh, somebody on TV, or maybe I was reading this this week, about somebody that was just giving another person uh, just a, a really bad time just irritating and annoying and even worse than that, just telling lies about the person and trying to get them fired maybe at work. But um, and, I, and, and there was um, some um, talk by the wife that, oh, wow, we should get at this person. We should do this. We should do that. We should do this. And, and the fellow that was being talked about or being annoyed or being irritated said, you know what? I wonder what their home life was like. I wonder why they're so bad to me. There's something else going on. And, and, and he was a Christian and had a proper perspective. He was looking uh, at an eternal perspective, at what could be hindering this man from coming into a full, right relationship with Jesus Christ. And that is a good lesson or a good application of this psalm, a fixing of our eyes on the master so that when these little irritations come, or even big irritations, man, we have a different perspective, right? Let's go on to Psalm 124. The Lord, the defense of his people, a song of ascents, or Psalm 124, my caption says, the Lord, the defense of his people, a song of ascents of David. Here's one from David. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. We would have been buried or drowned. I put that in there. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers or the ones who catch birds. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. <laughs> I mean, this is the psalm as they're walking up there. They're remembering those things that had happened to them. Those things on all those years of slavery and torture and then wandering in the wilderness and, and well, but even before that, getting out of that by this miraculous parting of the sea. And uh, they can say then, man, if it hadn't been for the Lord, we'd been totally wiped out. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I remember. Thank you. Even uh, our soul, our eternal destiny was in the snare of these bird catchers. You know, one of the things... Uh, the Bible uh, portrays our enemy as is birds, right? And uh, there's a story, I think it centers around the, uh, the tree that grows, uh, the mustard seed tree that grows up, and there's a, there's a bird, and oftentimes commentators talk about that being as the enemy of our souls, right? And so, wow, our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. Now, file that away for a minute, because we're going to come back and talk to that from the... Uh, in the next psalm. But we do it by the blood of Jesus. That's how we overcome. That's how the gate's been unlocked. That's how the cage has been unlocked. And we can fly away free and at liberty and happy and joyous, even in the midst of very difficult circumstances sometimes. By the blood of Jesus Christ, not by you or me stealing the keys and unlocking, or not by sawing the cage away. We are set free by the blood of Christ. Now, go on to Psalm 125, and it, it kind of relates here. A song of ascent. As they get closer, they're into the city gates now. They're going towards that temple, and this is fantastic. They say, those who trust in the Lord are like 
are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. (laughs) Eternal, right? Now we're talking about eternal things. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous reach out their hands to iniquity. Do you do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts as for such as turn aside to their crooked ways. The Lord shall lead them with the workers of iniquity. See, I read you that passage in Colossians to begin because it says that we are to set our things on uh, things above or set our minds on things above. We're to have an eternal perspective. And as we get to know and trust and love as he loves us, the Lord Almighty, we come to the realization that something else is going on in the world. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. And you know that scripture. There's something else in the spiritual realm that's going on as we go to our jobs every Monday morning, as we come home every Friday night, as we live and laugh and love and sometimes cry all during the weekends, right? And it happens one right after the other. There's something else going on. And we, I said this several times now, you're probably tired of me saying it, but Genesis 3 is so powerful because something so bad and dastardly happened to the human race back then. We rebelled and sin entered in and it's terrible and it's miserable and it's causing people to be messed up and to do bad stuff and to be warped and you saw it on the news yesterday. People were shot at the grocery store in Arizona and people are off track. You you just can walk outside, look at the news and you can see it and God put together a plan that restores that. And he has an eternal perspective. He is so interested in correcting that. He sent his son to die for each of us. He's interested. He wants us to have eternal life with him. He wants us then, even on this earth, to enjoy a joyous, victorious life in the Lord. But I got to tell you, As I was reading through these Psalms, I was thinking, and I could almost hear you thinking, really? I'll lift my eyes up to the hills. Uh, My help comes from the Lord. He who keeps you, he won't allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. But did you have this question as you were reading this stuff? Well, and and I heard you earlier saying the prayers. Wait a minute. My brakes went out. (laughs) Right? Uh, You heard lots of people here talk about cancer, uh, death, dying. That happens every day. It's going to happen to us. One out of one of us are going to die physically. Every one. So what is... The psalmist talking about here, if God is our keeper, he won't allow us to slip. He doesn't slumber. What is this psalmist talking about? And I think back in 125, here comes a little clue. But abides forever. There's something eternal about the Lord. If he's our protector, we say, then why do these things that we've just mentioned even here today happen to us, his kids? Go to Matthew 10, would you please? By the way, that topic is probably bigger than the 15 or 10 minutes I have left. But we're going to look at something in Matthew 10 if I can get there, (laughs) that Jesus taught about. If you have a Bible with red letters, these would be red. And it says this in 28. Jesus said this, And do not fear those who kill the body, 
but cannot kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy, destroy excuse me, both soul and body in hell. Jesus didn't deny that things were going to happen to this body. Such tough things that it was going to kill this body. Such difficult things, death, disease, that's going to happen. But there is another perspective. Eternal separation from me is so awful. I don't want you to go there. That's what he's saying to us. And so I think that God first and foremost, hear that now, first and foremost is most concerned with each of our spiritual health. And when it comes to that, he set up the perfect plan, the perfect provision, and nothing can keep us, Romans 8 tells us, from that love. Nothing can separate us from that love. And that love is a person. It's a person, Jesus. So first and foremost, that's what he wants. He wants to protect us from eternal judgment. He wants to keep us from eternal judgment, eternal death. I read this from a famous author. I'll read it to you. Very quick statement. And this is a real eternal perspective. Here you go. Death <clears throat> is the chariot God uses to bring an, us to himself. Let me read that again. Death is the chariot. He's talking about physical death. Death is the chariot that God uses to bring us to himself. <laughs> now that is quite an eternal perspective. Let's go on to Psalm 126. This is another song of ascents, or continuing on with the song of ascents. They're returning to the city, the one that holds the sanctuary where the Lord resides. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, talking about uh, bringing back the, the people who had been uh, in captivity in Babylon, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing bringing his sheaves with him. Now, think about this. <laughs> Captivity of Egypt <laughs> enjoyed some, they went into the promised land, enjoyed some, you know, quote unquote prosperity, or they're doing well, they're kind of sailing along. They get away from their foundational spiritual moorings and, oh, here come some prophecies and, oh, they're taken away to Babylon again. And then their, a decree goes out and they're allowed to come back into the land that God has set for them, has promised to them. And they do it. And so in one of their writings, they, in one of their singings, as they're going up to Jerusalem, they say this. When the Lord brought us back out of the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. It was like a dream to us. Oh, it was so wonderful to be back around and with God, of course, but and, and he never left them, but to be where uh, he wants us to be in his will with the people of the Lord with us. Isn't that kind of how we feel here? I, I hope so. I mean, whether you're going to, uh, you know, Calvary Chapel, Pittsburgh, or you're, you're at some other church or you're, you're at a Bible study, isn't it wonderful to come back? And we talked about it earlier, but to come back after that week of hardness or that year of hardness of being away and to come back and to worship and to fellowship and to study his word and, and to be accepted and loved. It was like a dream to them. 